really appreciate everyone joining here tonight um, for what we're calling Cases with Castle Biosciences. So with that, we'll kick off the event here. We'll get started in earnest. Uh, my name is Matt Goldberg. I'm a dermatologist, dermatopathologist, um, and medical director here at Castle Biosciences. Uh, and I have the distinct pleasure to moderate the session tonight uh, with our presenter, Dr. Drazen Jukic, um, who's going to be sharing cases from his clinical practice um, that have incorporated uh, gene expression profile testing. Go to the next slide, please. So just a couple of housekeeping um, items before we get going. If uh, folks could mute their phones during the session, I think everybody's already uh, done so. And we've already had a couple of questions you know, come through uh, in the chat. So there is a chat function. We'll monitor it through the session. And please uh, participate. Anyone can chime in during this. This is um, you know, being recorded and archived. We will be making it available um, online to the participants and, and registrants um, here. Um, and we encourage your participation. This is going to be uh, interesting and dynamic, and we look forward to kind of having this be a, a dynamic conversation tonight around cases that Dr. Yukich is kindly sharing. Go to the next slide. I want to start here by uh, putting uh, relevant disclosures for both myself and Dr. Yukic. Next slide. And I wanted to just give a, a quick background for those who don't know uh, Dr. Yukic, just to provide a little bit of background of had the pleasure of collaborating with him um, on research during my time here at Castle Biosciences. Um, and my background, Dr. Drazen Yukic is a dermatopathologist based in Savannah, Georgia. Um, he received his medical degree from the University of Zagreb School of Medicine is, and has been in practice for 24 years. Um, his, he specializes in dermatopathology and anatomic pathology um, with expertise in cutaneous lymphomas, melanocytic neoplasms, and uh, oncologic pathology. Uh, he has an active consultation service via conventional and digital pathology with many publications, over 100 publications and over 1,000 citations. Um, Dr. Yukich is past director of dermatopathology at the University of Pittsburgh and James A. Haley VA Medical uh, Center and is associate professor at Mercer University and University of Florida and visiting professor at University of Zagreb School of Medicine. He also holds leadership positions in several professional societies, including the ASTP, ISTP, uh, and MAG. So, uh, real, really a pleasure to have you uh, tonight as the presenter and look forward to hearing uh, your cases and sharing the conversation with those who have joined tonight. I wanted to kick off the conversation first with a, uh, an introduction about uh, gene expression profile testing here at Castle Biosciences and a bit about Castle Biosciences molecular uh, platforms that we offer. Uh, not only in um, dermatology, we have testing uh, offerings in gastroenterology, mental health, uveal melanoma, but really the focus tonight is on our dermatology portfolio that includes uh, molecular uh, diagnostic and prognostic tests for patients with impactful dermatologic uh, malignancies. And so today we'll be focusing on the diagnostic aspect, but I want to highlight that in our dermatology portfolio, we have the prognostic test, Decision DX melanoma for cutaneous melanoma and Decision DX SCC for patients with cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma and one or more risk factors. These are prognostic gene expression profile tests, and the focus of the conversation tonight is on diagnostic gene expression profile testing. These are um, MyPath melanoma, which aids in the diagnosis and management of patients who have equivocal or ambiguous melanocytic lesions, those that can't be confidently diagnosed uh, as benign or malignant melanocytic neoplasms using light microscopy and the tools that dermatopathologists have within their uh, workflows in-house. This is an ancillary diagnostic testing modality uh, that we're really looking to see how it works in clinical practice uh, through the lens of the cases that Dr. Jukic has contributed tonight. Next slide, please. So I, I want to start off just with a, a quick introduction about diagnostic ancillary testing for melanocytic neoplasms. And this is uh, you know, very elementary for many of those on the call here tonight, but I want to start out that the ancillary diagnostic tools that we use in dermatopathology are based on, um, you know, these different analytes that we might look at, DNA, RNA, and protein following the central dogma here in this slide. And some of the testing modalities look at different aspects uh, of this flow from the, the genome itself, from the DNA to the expressed proteins. And so when we think about the different testing modalities that we have access to, it's important to understand what type of analyte we're looking at. So uh, when we're thinking about modalities like FISH, uh, fluorescence and situ hybridization, or array CGH, um, SNP analysis or next generation sequencing, these are modalities that look at uh, the chromosome itself, copy number alterations, or particular point mutations in the DNA. So the analyte here is the DNA. 
Moving on the other end or its translation on proteins, these are things that we look at routinely with immunostochemistry, looking at whether or not a particular protein is present or absent in the tissue, where it's located in the tissue and the relative intensity with which it's present. And we'll be focusing the conversation tonight here in the middle zone on transcription on RNA and specifically messenger RNA, where gene expression profile testing measures level of, of RNA that's expressed, looking at sets of target genes um, compared to a set of reference genes that are really looking to detect patterns in gene expression um, and can use algorithms to identify particular outcomes of interest, whether those be diagnostic in, in their aims or prognostic based on the type of test that's developed. So this is obviously very, very basic discussion, but just wanted to focus that some of the different ancillary tests that we use in dermatopathology focus on different aspects of this same uh, movement from DNA to RNA to proteins. Um, one of the features of the webinar is that we're going to have some poll questions that my colleagues will put forward. Um, these slides are designated in red here in the bottom right. So you'll see a quick poll question pop up before we go into further detail on RNA and gene expression profile testing, which is the focus of the conversation tonight. Give people a few seconds to answer that and we'll move on. I don't see the live results pop up, but really appreciate people's participation in answering these questions here as they come up through, through the presentation. Next slide. All right, so looking at uh, and focusing in on RNA and thinking about gene expression profile testing, okay? All right, I'm seeing the results here pop up on, on the screen. Thank you. So thinking about gene expression profile testing, what is this test modality as a diagnostic ancillary test? And, and what it's doing fundamentally is measuring the, the patterns of gene expression in a, a melanocytic neoplasm of uncertain malignant potential. And it's not analyzing a specific you know, single cell in that lesion, but rather uh, the melanocytic neoplasm and its surrounding uh, microenvironment as this is a technique that uses macro dissection, as I'll talk about here in a moment. Um, and the, the focus of this is to use an objective testing modality, one that assays the gene expression of the lesional tumor tissue and look at the patterns of the gene expression that can be matched to particular biologic functions. The function of these genes is known and can be used to differentiate the, between the malignant potential of a set of benign nevi who have a particular expression profile using this technique and a group of malignant melanomas that have a different expression profile and really looking at how a, a lesion with equivocal or unambiguous malignant potential, um, where that expression most closely maps, whether it maps more closely to benign nevi or to malignant melanoma. Um, and if you go to the next slide here, the development of these tests goes through a, a rigorous process, first looking at many genes in a a discovery step where many candidate genes in both biased and unbiased fashions can be evaluated from the literature. Um, and this gene list is narrowed to those genes that actually have differential expression. So not like looking necessarily at the DNA mutations that drive malignant melanoma, but focusing on the differences in gene expression between benign nevi and malignant melanomas. And what are the, what are the genes that are expressed with the greatest differences that produce the most split between benign lesions and malignant lesions that really inform a locked algorithm, a set of genes that are then evaluated uh, in training. This is a narrowed group uh, of genes that produce a locked algorithm that can be uh, constructed using different mathematical models, logistic regression or neural networking that design an algorithm that has the best fit that provides the greatest separation between benign nevi and malignant melanoma and subsequently can be validated on independent cohorts of samples that have either known outcomes or uh, known assessment by a group of consensus dermatopathologists, and as well can include lesions of equivocal uh, malignant potential uh, as well. And fundamentally, these gene expression profile patterns can be matched to specific uh, features such as the malignant potential of the lesion and provides objective information about the gene expression to aid in the diagnostic workflow for clinicians who are using this information to inform their diagnosis. Uh, next slide. I want to provide here, we have a, you know, a group of dermatopathologists and others who are joining here on this call. How does the gene expression profile testing work at Castle Biosciences? And I think understanding this workflow helps to unpack a little bit what does gene expression profile do and what does it offer for patients? So essentially when 
the, the what precedes this slide is that a clinician who's treating the patient or who is diagnosing um, the, the patient, patient sample under the microscope identifies a case where the malignant potential of the lesion can't be determined with certainty using the tools that they have at their fingertips. The difference between a malignant melanocytic neoplasm and a benign melanocytic neoplasm can't be made definitively by this ordering clinician, and an order uh, is placed to Castle Biosciences. The material is sent to our laboratory uh, at Castle Biosciences, where um, a dermatopathologist will review the slide image for tumor content, meaning that the slides that are submitted for review are are evaluated to make sure that the block is not exhausted and the area is annotated so that lesional tumor tissue is actually evaluated and present on the slide such that gene expression profiling can be performed. That lesion is then macro dissected, uh, paraffin is removed, and the RNA is actually extracted from the uh, glass slides, the unstained slides that are submitted as part of the test ordering. RT-PCR is performed um, and it's qu quantified essentially. The raw data is then placed into the validated locked algorithm that produces the test result uh, for the particular gene expression profile test. And this uh, pipeline essentially of how the test is run in the laboratory is the same for both diagnostic and prognostic gene expression profile tests. This includes a diagnostic GEP that we're discussing tonight. Next slide, please. And when we apply gene expression profiling for um, ambiguous melanocytic lesions, what we're looking at um, is looking at a set of discriminant genes as well as reference genes through a classification algorithm to get to uh, a gene expression profile that's suggestive of a malignant neoplasm, intermediate, where a malignancy can't be excluded, or a benign melanocytic. Essentially providing the clinician with information about um, the gene expression of the lesion that's submitted for testing. Next slide, please. Here's just an overview of the evidence supporting gene expression profiling. This is just scratching the surface of the detail that's provided. This includes analytic validity, clinical validity, and clinical utility data de demonstrating how gene expression profiling can add uh, diagnostic clarity to cases submitted for testing. And that produces reliable results uh, that, that are objective uh, for the case submitted for testing. Next slide. And then finally, the strength of this supported evidence has led to um, guideline support for ancillary diagnostic testing modalities that include gene expression profiling for lesions that can't be confidently diagnosed as either benign melanocytic neoplasms or malignant melanocytic neoplasms. And there's some differences in, in these different statements, which we can go into further detail about, but it's one of the, gene, one of the ancillary diagnostic tests that can be used uh, when clinicians are faced with this diagnostic dilemma. And I think the cases, or my hope is that these cases tonight that Dr. Yukich will go through I will identify how clinicians can use this information to inform their diagnostic workflows. And with that, I have the pleasure of passing it to Dr. Jukic to continue the conversation. All right, so hello everybody again. Um, if I start scratching my ass, it's because pollen is really high here in Georgia. So pardon me about that. But anyway, let's go uh, straight to the first case. So first case uh, that we had here was a 17 year old female with a brown papule. And I'll do my best to show you stuff here. Uh, so when I first looked at this slide, and uh, it was obvious that we are dealing with asymmetric lesion uh, with prominent dermal component, which is somewhat hyperchromatic with crowding in the epidermis. And <clears throat> there's not much maturation seen on the H and E slide that we had here. So I kind of, to, to tell you how I approach these cases, I usually do immunohistochemistry first, and this is some of the antibodies we did. And if I decide to send it to either fish or GEP or both, I will issue a preliminary report where I will say what I favor. And that's not just to give clinicians some guidance, but also to give me a guidance. So later on, when I get results, I can compare it. Uh, once I get the results from either or both of these uh, procedures, I don't report things in the vacuum, meaning I'll get the reports and then I will sit with two of my colleagues and we'll look at it again in the view of results received, at which time we decide what to do with the results, how much is it believable and are they helpful or not. In this case, <clears throat> PRIM was negative. There was stratification with cyclin D1 and AGMB45, and there was increased pickup of KI67. P53 
was preserved. If you see here, this is your negative frame. Uh, our frame, in this case, I'll tell you what is red or brown. You can see it's red frame because you see nicely reactive uh, sebaceous glands. Then keeping further, this was cyclin D1, which showed stratification. And I believe next one was P16 that showed preserved outline. But again, I ju we just didn't like this for somebody who is 17 year old, broadly involves the ink tissue edge and whatnot. This is tyrosinase KI67 dual antibody. If you want to appreciate the brown is KI67 and red is tyrosinase. You can also appreciate fair amount of pagetoid scatter in the epidermis, some dismaturation changes, and there is some <clears throat> stratification with tyrosinase, but not much in my view. So my preliminary was a typical compound melanocytic ne neoplasm between highly atypical spitz neus and spitzoid melanocytic neoplasm on certain biologic significance. And this was kind of code word for both me and the clinician that I don't favor melanoma, but just to be sure, I would like to send it for additional molecular studies. What well, the ancillary testing um, came uh, back, the fish was negative. There was some changes in CCND1 gene, but it was below the uh, below the uh, cutoff point. And then the GEP came back as benign. Now we looked at the lesion again, and again, remember 17 year old, this was, we settled on a typical spitzoid neoplasm ink tissue edges involved. So basically in this case, we really wanted them to excise it with appropriate margins because we didn't want the, uh, somebody to go and say, hey, you know, this could still be melanoma because they're not certain and patient needs sentinel node and whatnot, give patient basically. Uh, so in, in my mind, this was benign. Question might arise, you know, why did you even do it? Because you're gonna re-excise it. But to me, it was another checkpoint here. What am I checking? I'm checking to make sure that molecular didn't put me over the edge and that I missed the melanoma, especially with the fact that the deep tissue edge was so involved. Now, case number two, and you'll see progression in the age through the bio, uh, through the presentation, was 26-year-old male. He developed this lesion on the temple, brown macule with abnormal coloring and borders. And of course, you know, clinically, we got congenital nevus versus dysplastic nevus. So you can see here, it's pretty large shave relatively shallow, but again, you see a melanocytic neoplasm with some epidermal hyperplasia with areas of irregular growth, uh, nest fusion, basically uh, hyperchromasia and increased melanin production here. What we see is like some uh, Focal upward spread dust also with kind of strong expression of KI67, and I'll show that later. This is, I believe, yeah, this is SOX10, and you can appreciate much better the outline of the neoplasm here. We you see that it's asymmetrical, it reveals rather ill-defined edges. On the next slide, I believe this is Tyrosin SK67, if I remember right, yep. You can appreciate kind of strong increase in K67 and more of the architectural disorder here. And then here we had Prame and Prame was really unusually strong. And not only that, I didn't really see any change between superficial dermal and was kind of concerning. Obviously here you even see epidermis, not just melanocytic going to the deep tissue edge, but I also didn't like it going in the follicle like this, as single cells as opposed to nests. 26 year old temple, you do wanna of course allow for degree of uh, cytologic uh, atypia and you wanna allow for degree of cytologic uh, of 
architectural disorder. So, however, we did say that by immunohistochemistry, early melanoma cannot be ruled out. So, going next to this, fish came back negative. And now if we go back to, this was always my problem with fish, but if I go back to suck stand on this one, you can start to appreciate it. There is not that much dermal component noted. And I don't know, at least in my experience, how much I can trust fish when it has minimal dermal component. So yeah, fish was negative and it wasn't blatantly, you know, positive. So that was good. However, GP came back as suggestive of malignancy. We went back and actually did do more cuts and looked at more slides. And I think altogether we had like maybe like 15 with the levels and settled on early malignant melanoma in situ arising in a compound melanocytic nevus and uh, basically complete removal was recommended. I haven't seen anything here uh, that would be indicative straight up of invasive melanoma. We wanna share results here. Before, before before we go on to case three, Dr. Yukitz, there's a question or a comment from uh, Dr. Prieto on case one. Um, essentially, in your opinion, given the benign gene expression profiling, um, should we call it a typical sp spitzoid lesion for case one? If, just going back to how you mm -hmm. write the, na the naming of the final top line for that first case, maybe just to go into further detail there. Yeah, I... I, if I'm let this is the nomenclature I use, it might be slightly different than the others. If I'm 100% sure it's benign, I will call it a typical spitz neus or spitz neus with atypia. If I calling it a typical spitz with neoplasm, I basically think it has higher potential of recurrence. I don't use the terminology lesion or proliferation. And then if I'm 100% sure that is a melanoma, it should be treated as melanoma, I will put the word melanoma in there. So yeah. that, that's my philosophy again, you know, I mean, so. All right, th thank you, Dr. Jukic. I hope that answers your question, Dr. Peter. Okay, case three was 33 year old female with hyperpigmented macula on the right arm. And just to re remind you as like lots of people in Southern states, we get lots of solar damage in these younger people. So don't be surprised. So this was a Rather disorganized lesion in my view, kind of had like even some spongiosis, epidermal hyperplasia. It had large nests, but it was kind of ending with nests. Uh, what you're seeing here is one of the last levels on the, which was scanned by Castle, but even on this level, you can start appreciating early pagetoid spread in it. Um, the, Immunohistochemistry we did on this was, I believe this was uh, cyclin D1. Yeah, so this was cyclin D1. You can see that it's pretty expressed. This was P16, and this was the first issue with this that it started losing P16 in some areas, and especially in the intraepidermal component, where you have some normal melanocytes picking up on the edge. And then right here, which is our dual antibody, I believe, AGMB45 frame, you can start appreciating, uh, see if I can turn this better, at least it's straight. You can start appreciating dark nuclei throughout with expression of frame in the dermal component, almost the same level that what you have in the epidermal component. And that, same expression pattern was seen at the edges of the lesion, suggesting that this is whole one tumor as opposed to something arising in the other. So we actually, and this is my also terminology, a typical nevus versus higher grade lesion. If I'm not 100% that this could be melanoma, I, I try not to put it in the report to prevent any copy paste later or anything like that. So, Basically, GP came back as suggestive of malignancy. So we went back and looked at it and ended up calling it spitzoid or spitz like melanoma, depending on the uh, nomenclature you like. Uh, this was the entire synoptic copied here. The breast low depth was 0.3. 
And let me go back and just show you again on H and E quickly what I'm talking about. Okay, this thing is, oh, here we go. So when I look at this, to me, this whole neoplasm looks the same. I don't see maturation. Most of the melanocytes in the dermis look exactly the same as melanocytes in the epidermis. So unless I see dual cell population, I'm not going to call it melanoma in situ arising in the nevus, or unless I see differential, uh, differential antibody expression. And in this case, antibody expression was pretty much the same. One of the reasons we didn't send it for fish was because of the material wasn't uh, was becoming scanned and there was not dermal component. Now, the advantage here, obviously, is if you have it in Castle, they can run the uh, uh, decision DX for predictability of sentinel lymph node, and that came back as 1A. And you know, I could talk about this, this later offline or whatever. If you guys need have any additional questions, you can also email me. Dr. Dr. Yukos, I had a quick question, just doing a step back about you know how you selected the special stains. You mentioned how you, you didn't opt for fish in this case based on kind of limitations in the dermal population, having it be kind of a small volume of lesional cells here. What, what about the special stains, even just the chemical studies that you ordered for that, that case? Well, I mean, how, did you, how did you arrive at those? Is that for that particular one? Well, I mean, in general, we have like two main algorithms. One is if I see older person with prominent uh, architectural disarray and uh, mole antigenous slash superficial spreading kind of melanoma with remodeling of the epidermis, we tend to go to SOX, PRAME, MITF, basically to look for the architecture. In my experience, P16, cycling D1 do not add much in those cases and we do do PRAME. Uh, then if lesion is more specific in younger people, they have bulging nests and you can actually see kind of appears to be growing. I think P16, cycling D1 are much more helpful. I do always do PRAM on this just because it's a new antibody, but I don't personally think in lots of them PRAM adds, adds much if it's negative. Now, in my experience also, we could talk about it, but there's a paper coming out. We had a poster on it. Only less than 3% of melanomas are completely PRAM negative. So, you know, Prime negativity might help you, but this excluded the spitoid lesion. We'll do a different paper on that later. Hope that answers your question, Dr. Goldberg. No, thank you, yeah. Okay, so this is case number four, which was 26-year-old 26 26 female with dark brown macula and left superior buttock. And, you know, in my, our practice, uh, I can tell you exactly based on the shit, <laughs> size of shave biopsy who actually biopsied that but again 26 year old uh again we're starting to see like the motif of this presentation and that's epidermal hyperplasia with kind of irregular proliferation of melanocytes throughout the epi if you go higher start kind of seeing disorganized nest tough uh 26 year old find if significant dermal component and that's other thing that i like to uh usually know to fellows and the residents as well as younger colleagues is like if you have significant dermal component you want to be significantly sure it's not melanoma because that's the component that's going to give you uh problems later so i ended up calling this a typical pizzoid neoplasm but the thing here was that the frame was strongly positive. Let me just see if this is frame. Oh, what is this? Because slides are not labeled. No, I don't believe, I believe this is cycling D1. And then if we go higher, yeah, this is P16. So you can see cycling one was somewhat overexpressed. P16 mainly preserved in the intraepidermal component, but kind of losing it a little bit in the dermal component. And then let me see this. This, I believe, was melan A PHH3, and we were looking actually for dermal mitosis, and there were none, fortunately. But then I think this was praying. 
No. And, just... and PHH3, phosphohistone H3, correct, Dr. Rico? Correct, yeah. That's the mitotic marker. And in this case, I think the frame was first slide I showed you, not cycling. Cycling was actually negative. So the frame was strongly positive. So I'm having here now a case that is pizzoid and really shouldn't have strong expression of frame like that. Uh, losing P16, what do I do with this? Uh, there is dermal component, uh, but there is no uh, there is no clear cut features indicating melanoma, and especially here in this case was at least to my eye, I did not. I was concerned, and what mostly concerned me was frame and loss of P16. And I showed it to two of my other colleagues, and they were like really concerned. So. I was a little bit more on the edge, didn't want to, you know, this was on a Baroque special site, architectural, not, and it's relatively small. So I was hoping for the best here. Well, ancillary testing came back as intermediate. So basically telling you GP result indicates an intermediate uh, gene expression profile that cannot exclude malignancy. Now, in this case, I called it a typical special melanocytic neoplasm of uncertain biologic potential because you have at least two strikes against benign, which is you have frame expression and then you have starting to lose P16, but then you don't have obvious indication that this is melanoma on the uh, molecular, on GEP. And some of the other antibodies are okay, like PHH3 didn't show mitosis. There's no pagetoid scatter per se. There was no increase in KI67, all that stuff. Levels were pretty much okay, and it was relatively small. So basically, why did I didn't why wouldn't I call this just a typical spitz neus? As I said, it's because there's two strikes, but I was really glad that this case, in this case, it did not came back as malignant. And that allowed me to call it a typical compound spitzer melanocytic neoplasm of uncertain biologic potential. What this means, at least in our group, is that patients are going to be checked more often. They will not go and get like some heroic stuff done, like sentinel lymph node on her or whatnot. And she might have like a couple more things removed. And then eventually, after like three or four years, she will start getting like uh, less checked out. In this patient, I think it's important to say that, especially with younger people, unless you 100% sure this melanoma, like we were in the case three, I don't think you should label them as such because you know that will necessitate all kind of uh, additional stuff, including like yearly or whatever six months GP scans, this that referral to oncology, you know, lots of uh, ethic terms. So I think in this case. It really has a but it's not exactly the same as the other cases they told you, but it was a little bit different. And this is a... Dr. Yukich, I think your microphone seems to have gotten a little staticky. Maybe try muting and unmuting. Okay, how about now? Yes, that's better. Okay, thank you. Loud and clear. Uh, do I need to repeat anything I said before? Yeah, I would start again for case case five. Okay, so case five is a little bit different. It's a 60-year-old gentleman here, and I think was on the left upper back. So sun exposed area, but it still has the motif of epidermal hyperplasia. In this case, you do have epidermal hyperplasia that's slightly different, and that is seborrheic keratosis like epidermal hyperplasia. Or we can argue over a couple of shots of whiskey whether this is really SK with melanocytic neoplasm arising within it or melanocytic neoplasm um, inducing the. SK like hyperplasia. Yeah, I think it doesn't matter in the long term, but what you see here is obviously this organized growth of melanocyte throughout the SK. We are all familiar here, I think, on this call, on this presentation with colonization of melanocytes into the SK. We can talk about uh, 
and just to spell SK seborrheic keratosis, right? So, and we all know about uh, in 60s, 70s, 80s, there were like this melanoacantoma type one and type two, which we don't use right now, we still use in oral pathology. But when you start looking at individual melanocytes here, I mean, I'm starting not to like these architectural growth pattern. And you can see them here, here, here. They almost look like uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma infiltrating uh, SK, and they are going up. What really got me going on this case is if you look at the, this case was fortunately or unfortunately a little bit misembedded because they flipped the other piece for 180. But if you look at the edge where you don't have clear cut seborrheic keratosis, you're starting to see the same amount of individual melanocytes and they just keep on going like Energizer Bunny throughout the whole thing. So go over it a little bit. I basically indicated what I told you. And this was actually multi layered immuno uh, track because we first just ordered tyrosine stock stand to look for melanocytes to make sure nothing is out of uh, ordinary. And then that confirmed our suspicions of the, uh, on the initial agony, after which we actually ordered more immunos. So this one here, well, I believe this is MITF. So if you look at it here, you can start seeing that there is way too many melanocytes than what you usually see and what you usually want to see here. And the same melanocytes are seen here. Our MITF is slightly dimmer than the other antibodies. This, I believe, is tyrosinase SOX10. If I remember right. No, this is PRAME, sorry. This is PRAME, and you can see that PRAME agent B45 you can see PRAME in this case is brown and agent B45 is red. You can see that most of these melanocytes that are PRAME positive don't even have that much cytoplasm. So you don't see those melanocytes that we classically seen uh, in lentigo maligna and whatnot. These are small melanocytes that overexpress PRAME. And you can see here also that they're starting to pick in the dermal component. So basically it's had yeah, nests are there, there might be nevus, but you know, I'm really suspicious about the insight to melanoma. Now we all know limitations of fish here. I mean, fish is not gonna give you anything extra. The other thing we could have done is like keep doing levels and keep doing some more immunos just to look at for more architecture. But I kind of thought it would be important to see, to send here a uh, case for GEP because that would give us like clear cat indication. If GP comes back benign, that just means we are dealing here with unusual prime expression. And I think you guys have all probably seen it by now. There are these cases that look completely benign, they express prime, and we don't know yet what to do with them. And hopefully we will down the line, but right now it's, you know, we, we really don't. So what did we get? Well, we got back gene profile suggestive of malignancy. So when you will go back, especially on that agent B45 frame antibody slide, you can see that, okay, there is a potential nest here. There's potential nest here. That one might be outpouching of it. And then the thing kind of, there's a frame, 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 keeps on going, just keeps on going and I actually, in these cases, quite often, we take images on all the patients. I will ask for image, and this one I didn't have uh, for presentation, but this one was just a lesion on his upper back, and the guy did not have like that usual strong solar damage that we see in Southern Georgia and Florida, where like I have one of my most surgeons called these people like walking brain people. You know, like basically every lentigo that they have will express uh, prime. That is not the case here. This guy had an isolated new lesion. So after like going back and forth and looking, we ended up calling it early malignant melanoma. Breast low depth was one uh, was 0.4, but again, it's 0.4 because as you remember, I showed you on that slide with uh, prime. 
this area here has tremendous amount of SK-like hyperplasia. If we would be measuring from here, it would be much less. So what do we do with this patient? Well, he also got the decision DX with 2.5% uh, positivity, uh, likelihood of positive sentinel lymph node biopsy, class 1A, and I think uh, I, I know the most surgeon who has him, now, uh, Durham surgeon, he basically just said they opted to excise completely and they're gonna follow him uh, pretty closely. One other thing with the older population in the Southern states, I think it's like, if you have one melanoma, it's very likely you're gonna have another one. So that will just result in people taking their uh, skin health a little bit more, uh, a little bit more diligently. So I think this was the last case. So I'm gonna open for Q&A and let Dr. Goldberg moderate. Yeah, so I have a first question just to kick off. I mean, I asked you a little bit earlier around case three, you know, how you selected different immunostains that you have in your, your lab. You know, you have access to a range of molecular tools in-house. You have a range of stains and double stains in-house that you've optimized. Talk me a little bit through just the process of when you think about gene expression profile testing, when, when you kind of turn to that modality and, and how you know that a case might be one that for you, gene expression profiling adds value. Yeah. So just to tell you, I'm going to tell, I'm going to speak off, you know, off the top of my head, but there, there's going to be poster on ISDP with one of my medical students who actually looked at the year of us ordering this stuff and how much do we order in which percentage. So people don't think I order immunos on everything or something like that. You know, it turned out we order immunos uh, antibodies on about 10%, if I'm going to be right, of melanocytic neoplasms. So, and then out of then 10%, 90% of that 10%, so like 9% of those, they get final diagnosis based on immunos. You know, if it's obvious melanoma, why do you do immunos? People would ask me, well, I do immunos because I want to sample more. And I want to make sure we don't miss the invasive component, you know, especially if it's in situ or early invasive. You want to give patient the choice to be like you know to be completely right uh then the what else uh then you know depending if it's like large pitoid lesion and you know before we had um diff dx in a uh, castle that really wasn't taking uh, cases that uh, like patients that were le less than 18 years old i would usually reflect to fish but now that, you know, my pet is in there and that doing comprehensive gene expression profiling, I might do both fish and GEP on those cases. But again, it's two checkpoints and two is better than one. One of the, and then like older people, if I'm not sure on immunohistochemistry, I will usually deflect straight for GEP if it's going to make any difference in their prognosis. So you might ask me like, okay, you have a guy with lentigo malignant who's 72, why are you doing GEP? Well, the only time I'm going to do GEP when I'm not sure whether it's in situ melanoma versus arising in the neus or early in invasive arising in the neus. And of course, I'm not going to do it for something that's 0.1 or 0.2, but like something that might be like closer to a millimeter. That's helpful. For, so you're thinking about, you know, the range of different tools that you have, the, the specifics of the case, but also the clinical impact. And so yes. do, do, you, do you often conference or dialogue with your dermatologist around this? Or? Yes, we actually have a, uh, and I, I'm no, no interest in this, but there is a great uh, phone app. It's called Threema, T-H-R-E-E-M-A, which is actually Swiss made. It's very cheap and it's super secure. It exceeds all the HIPAA security requirements. And we put everything on everybody on Trima and we actually send pictures to each other. We, I'll, I'll send them like uh, pictures through the scope, reports as PDF and all that. And it actually made all kind of uh, improvement. I can't even tell you how much better it made the whole, uh, the whole, exp uh, the whole uh, experience of, of sign out. And it's almost like you have people in the room. You can video them in, you can do this, you can do that. It's all secure, fine. We can share. And we actually have, for you guys who don't know, I don't sit in a hospital. I'm part of the multi-location practice. 
we have 27 clinics in different kinds of Georgia and one lab. So, I mean, it really helps us a lot. And then, you know, sometimes the PAs especially will call us pathologists up front with a clinical image of lesion and not just for melanocytic, but for like Danish T cell lymphoma and stuff. It's like, here's an image, circle where I need to biopsy or stuff like that. And, and we do that for them. And it's just been like great. So. Any other questions here from the, the chat or from the uh, participants here? Floor is open here to ask questions or type them into the chat. Yeah, and I'll say just as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, just go ahead and raise your hand with the function at the bottom of the screen and we'll unmute your line. You know, I, I'll just dovetail off your last comment here about, you know, the value of, of communication. I think that it's critical also, you know, but the collaboration to kind of that you, that you have with your dermatologist. I think that there's some people who are practicing within hospital systems who have a shared EHR where that's built in, but it sounds like you've developed a system to communicate in a secure fashion with, with clinicians. And in the same way, what, after you, you know, sign out a report where you've used a range of immunostains or gene expression profiling, will you talk to the clinician about significance of the report or kind of talk to them about it? Or, or how do you, or, or do you simply kind of have templated language or, or, or text that you use that inform your reports and, and your clinicians essentially receive that in writing? Or do you often follow up with a discussion? Or how do you communicate to your clinicians about your site? Well, I actually, each one of these cases, and these are just five example cases, I think I'm, you know, way, all, way over five, you know, in general with these. I call the people before I issue the final report because I don't want them like to be trying to meander through this and something that might be crystal clear to me might not be crystal clear to another physician and especially like PA. I mean, our PAs are mostly excellent, but you know, I've seen, I tell you, okay, I tell you the case. It was somebody in my family who, when she was pregnant, she had a nevus on the buttock, and I think she was 28 at that time, that did the same thing. And I was a fellow at that time, and I looked at that case, and I thought it was melanoma early. Uh, two other dermatopathologists thought there was not, so they ended up calling it severely atypical melanocytic nevus. And her gynecologist came in the room and said, oh, I saw the report, and it just says nevus, so you're fine. So basically that whole report went completely over his head and it was like this severely atypical thing that got re-excised, that she got followed for a bit and whatnot. And I realized early on that, you know, for stuff like this, you have to call people and you have to talk to them. The other thing is that the, some of them, you know, might be, might have no problem calling you. Some of them might not, don't like to call you. And then some of them, I want to call you, but they'll forget. And then things get lost in the shuffle. This way you're ensuring it's not lost. You know, basically the way I'd, I usually do this, I'll send a picture of the report or like of Castle or Fish report through Trima and say, hey, call me, I'm ready to issue an addendum. And then I'll walk them through what I'm going to say and what do they need to do. And, you know, they will usually tell me, oh, you know, uh, this is too much, I'm gonna send him to Emory, or like, this is too much, I'm gonna send him to oncology in Savannah, or stuff like that. And, or they will even ask me, well, what do you want us to do with this? And, you know, I'll tell them. That's great. I mean, I think there's just, you know, having clear dialogue between derm paths and derms, I think benefits patients, which is really the purpose of, you know, getting to diagnostic clarity for lesions in which it's difficult to make a decision about a benign lesion or malignant lesion based on the tools you have in-house. And I really appreciate you sharing these cases. And, and I don't see any further questions. I'll pause here once again, if others have questions that haven't been answered in the chat or people wanted to close a session with a, a comment or a question here, I'll pause for just a second. And really just want to thank everyone for their attention, uh, for joining the session, Dr. Yukich for sharing your cases and to the team here at Council for organizing this. Really appreciate you all joining. And um, we'll send an email out after the session 
Um, our emails will be in there as well as contact information for Dr. Yukich. And if there's further questions to continue offline, particular manuscripts to review, we'd be happy to go in depth offline and appreciate your atten uh, attention here and attendance uh, tonight. Have a great rest of your evening. Yeah, and feel free to email me if you have any other questions. So, All right. Thank you. Good night.